Welcome to module 11 of a course called Coding for Crosswords. For more information on the complete course, please see the links below. In this module, we will begin to discuss memory. Now, this can be a detailed topic, and I've waited to discuss it until we need it. And the reason we need it is because, as we learned in the previous module, some of the STL containers for C++ will move your objects around on you. Vector will do it when it resizes, and hash table or unordered map will do it, and others will do it as well. And so it's important now for us to understand as we start to build more function into our crossword puzzle program, how we can understand that and make sure it doesn't cause us problems when we create more complex data structures. And the data structure that we need in particular that forces this is this data structure for the pattern hash. If you remember the crossword puzzle we're trying to solve, and this is, this is it here, there's a dog in the upper left and a cat in the lower right. We're going to be trying to find words that will complete this crossword puzzle, that will construct this crossword puzzle out of this library of 12,000 words that we've read from the top 12,000 English words out of Google. The main function we want to make that process work is a thing called a pattern hash. It's going to be a wildcard pattern that we want to ask the library, how many words do you have that might be, for instance, D blank, blank, blank. And we hope to get words back like date or deer or any number of other words, dawn, that you can think of that begin with D. And to support that function, we want to create lists of words that will point to arbitrary combinations of other words. And that sort of rich data structure is really only possible if you understand how things are laid out in the memory system. So that's what we're gonna do in this module. And let's start with a fresh file here. If we look, we're gonna start with something not our normal, you know, a couple hundred line crossword puzzle code that we've been developing over the course of, this, of these modules. We're gonna start fresh. And let's build the very simplest program possible from a data point of view. Let's make one character. Remember, we talked about these characters and their ASCII encodings uh, in a previous module. And let's make it called C. And we're going to assign it, let's say, something like A, the letter A. And let's print it with this end of line. That is about as simple as it gets for understanding how data works. So um, let's compile this. And we go G++ minus OA. I'm just calling the output file A and then A.C. If that's new to you, please review many of the previous modules. We discuss the compile environment in more detail. So that will compile and then we run it and it prints A. Now, here's the part that people get confused about. People trying to understand computing they understand that you write a file like this. They understand that you can do things according to rules in the file, but they just don't quite get how this thing happens. How does this output get printed? And I think the missing piece for most people is not understanding the compiler. The compiler is really what's doing the bulk of the work here. There's a little bit of work by the operating system. And of course there's work by your actual computer, the CPU and the DRAM and the physical machine. But really the orchestrator of this, the brains of this operation is the compiler. And if you're running in interpreter languages like Python, it would be the interpreter. But C++ is a compiled language. So let's talk about what the compiler does. Now this file, a.c, it's just a document. You know, there's nothing magic about this document. It's the same as you're writing a letter to your mother. It's just a bunch of characters in a file. It's only when you run the compiler that it reads this and it tries to interpret these as instructions for what to, how to build a program. And what does it build? It builds an executable program that's in the machine language that the CPU on your machine will use. Um, and if you're using a browser, it's a little more complicated. It produces, you know, maybe even, you know, Java bytecode or something that gets executed in the browser, but that doesn't really matter. The point is that the compiler tries to lay things out and prepare this executable that, that, that will run and will obey the rules that you told it. And one of the key things that the compiler has to do is to lay out memory. And so let's just take a little look at what that means. So here's, let's say, here's your computer, okay? Here's your motherboard. And on the motherboard, there's a CPU. That's the master brains. And there'll be all these banks, and you probably bought DRAM for your computer, right? You go to Amazon and you buy these, these DRAM. And you plug those things into these slots, right? Um, 
those DRAM actually contain chips on them, usually many chips, that are actually what are storing the information. All the ones and zeros, you know, are being stored uh, electrically as charges on little bitty capacitors in those chips. And all that stuff gets connected through up to your CPU so that your CPU can read and write things to that memory. Now, all of that gets abstracted to this notion of a memory space. And all computers use what's called a byte addressable memory space. So all of that really amazing engineering down here that you can buy for a couple hundred dollars gets reduced to a view like this that goes from zero, let's say you bought eight gigabyte of RAM, you're gonna, it'll be go from zero up to eight billion. Now it won't be exactly eight billion, it's actually two to the 33, so it'll be a little more than eight billion, but roughly zero to eight billion bytes. That means that each one of these things that can be read or written independently and will be reliable, unless your machine is bad, uh, there's eight billion of those and the compiler can access any of them and read any of them and then do things with them, you know, do all kinds of math, um, you know, math or any kind of other operation you want, like crossword puzzle stuff. So this character C here, the compiler chooses one of those eight billion bytes to hold C. There are two things of interest in, in understanding what the compiler is doing. One is how big is C? And there's a function called size of that we'll use to explore that. And then there's also where did it put C? And for that, there are two operators in the C language. Um, the first one is this ampersand sign. So what we can do, and I'll show you this, and it's actually not gonna work for a reason I'll explain, but this will show you, this will print the value of C. And then this is the address of C. Now, it turns out that um, the standard output library in C++ is pretty smart and it overloads this to think you wanna print the actual C because people really don't ever wanna print the pointer values. What we're doing right now was just a, like a debug investigation. So if we run this, you'll notice that it's gonna print just A twice. Okay, so that's not quite what we want. So just for debug purposes, what we're gonna have to do, remember there's this thing called a void. Um, we're going to use that to kind of just trick the compiler right now into uh, showing us the actual pointer and not, not trying to be smart and show us what it thinks we want. So um, the other operator then that goes along with the ampersand is this asterisk uh, operator. And that, um, that means pointer or, or, or take the contents of. And so what we can do is define a pointer P that's going to get the address of C. Okay, I'll explain this a little bit more. This will become more clear as, as we go. So now we can print P and we can see what the address of C is in the, in the memory. Let's run that and here we go. And now we see this big number, right? This is a number that represents um, an address in that 8 billion space that we have. Uh, so that's where the compiler has put C. And then... Um, we also want to find out how big it is. So let's print next, let's print size of C. And we're going to see how big it is. Now we think care is one from what we've said before. So we hope this will return one and there it is. There's the one byte. So that gets us a little bit of insight into what's going on. Let's expand this a little, a couple ways. For one thing, let's do another character. Okay, let's make one called B. And let's maybe make this, uh, let's do P0 and P1. And we're gonna make, we're gonna do like this. We know the size is still gonna be one. That's okay, we're gonna remove that. Right, so we have a character C and now we have a character D. Just to give you an idea of what it's gonna do when we have more than one of these variables. Um, we can also print, just to be symmetric, we can print this. Okay, let's run that. And you see now we get two different addresses. And did you notice that, look, these addresses are only, they only vary by one byte. So it's really packed. You have 8 billion bytes to use and it's packed that C and that D right next to each other, which is good, right? Because maybe we're gonna use all 8 billion bytes. There's no reason to waste space in between them. That's called fragmented memory. You wanna really pack things tightly. So we're already pretty excited that it's, that it's packing things nicely. Now let's try a different data type. We know about int. Let's do an int in here. So we know about D. Let's get rid of D for a minute. Let's do an int equals 10. OK, 
okay and let's make p1 now be the address of the of the of the integer so here's the c here's the i and there's the p0 and there's the p1 so we're just doing the same thing now but with two different types of data there's a character and there's an int now we'd think int is probably bigger oh let's print the size up too let's um let me print them both just to be print the c okay so let's run that and i will show you what we get okay so a is our character 10 is the integer this is the address of c this is the address of the integer and it starts one byte right after c and then it's going to run four bytes more than that and then here's the size of the character and then four is the size of the integer so by default in the c language when you say int like this you're going to get a four byte int and that's a byte that holds 32 bits and it's it's signed so the first bit's a signed bit and then it goes from minus two billion to plus two billion um there's also an eight byte int that we can get to sometimes when you want to count things that are more than four billion and you don't want to have an overflow so let's go back and do a couple more exercises with this so that you understand let's make a, a pointer to a character called p and let's set that to be the address of c okay so now we have c as an actual character and then p is this thing called a pointer it has in it the, uh, the address where c is if we want to use that we can use this dereference operator again to say contents of p equals and let's make this b okay. so let's print out c here and let's do that and print it out again okay look carefully now and this would be a good challenge type this in and uh, run this and see what you get and think about what you might get first we're allocating some memory for c we write a to it we just store the address of c in this thing called p we print out c which should give us an a then we print out whatever's at the address of, of p we're actually assigning b to it and then we're going to print out c again so do you think this is going to this is going to print a b or is it going to be a a let's find out and it's a b because that pointer p is a valid pointer right into the memory of c so let's just really make sure you understand this here's this big list of memory right all the way from zero up to eight billion one of these spots in here the compiler has said that's where c is going to live and, and we wrote an a in there there's another variable which actually lives somewhere else on the stack it's actually a bigger thing called p and it has in it stored in it the address of c so when we take the p and we use this star p equals b we're finding the address of where the c is and we're writing the capital b to it so that replaces this a with a b and that's how we get the b printed next so i think it's worth doing a few of those on your own try with an int try with a character try to get the address of of them um, modify them um, and get a little more comfortable with the way that uh, memory uh, works I think it really is as simple as just m making sure you know where things get allocated and then understanding how to point to them okay if that's a little complicated it's okay just kind of hang on to it it may become more apparent over the course of this module the next topic is to talk about the call stack. When you call a function, how are the arguments passed into that function? And there are three ways we need to understand. One is called by value. And everything we've done so far in this module, in this course, in the modules, has been by value. There's another one called by reference, which ends up being a really useful one. And that's probably the most useful of these three. And then there's the third one, which is by pointer, which is occasionally useful. And I want to code up examples of each of these three. Let's start with a by value case. This should look familiar. We're going to have an int. Let's call it i. Let's make it equal to 10. Let's print what i is. Let's say orig i equals, and then let's print i. 
okay? Then let's call a function and pass i to it. Now let's make this function just something really easy. Let's say it takes now, let's call this x just so that we're clear on the naming. The name inside the function that you're calling doesn't have to be the same as the name that, uh, of the caller. Um, so inside here, the i, the 10, gets passed in as an argument to the foo. So x should get the value of 10 now. And we're gonna print out that value here. Let's say foo i equals i, we'll get that. Then we're gonna do something, we're gonna add, let's add one to i. Oh, oh down here it's x, <laughs> Right, so we've called it x down here. This wouldn't be able to see i, this is in the wrong scope for i. So we print out what x is, we add one, and then we print out x again. Let's call this foobar, just for, those are <laughs> old fashioned names. Okay, and then let's also print out down here, let's print out, let's say after. You can make up your own names for all this prints nonsense. Okay, let's look and see if this will compile. It should, right? We're just taking 10, we're printing out 10, we're gonna call this and we're gonna see what I is. In other words, we're gonna see, did this thing modify the I? When you call this foo, does this I still stay 10 or does it actually go up? And then what happens to the X inside here? So this is a challenge for you. Try to figure out what would happen and then go ahead and code this for yourself and run it and see if you were right. So hopefully you've done that and let's run it ourselves. And here we go. Um, oh, that's just uh, bad formatting by me. I cut and pasted that one wrong. Okay, so then we go, let's run that up here. Okay, so original i is 10, then we call into foo, and there it is 10, and then we add one to it, and there it goes to 11, and then we pop back out. And it's a different namespace, so that original i up in main did not care what foo did with its copy of it. So let's look at what that is in terms of the memory here. Here's your big memory structure, right? Here's the billion bytes, right? Okay. One of these, let's say this one right here, is where the compiler has decided to put i. So this is the location right here for i. When we call in to foo, so this is mains i here. When we call into foo, it's gonna copy that in and it's gonna make another location up here and it's gonna call that x. So it's a different piece of memory. And when it runs in foo, it's gonna do the plus equals one thing and it's gonna change this 10 to an 11. You come back down to main again and this copy of i here has not changed and it's still 10. Okay, now let's do the by reference case. As you can imagine, this might be a little different. So here we go. So let's leave this code. If it's not too complicated, I will leave this code here so we can see it all together. I'm gonna to make j be 20. I'm gonna print j here. I'm gonna call foo now with i and with j, so they're separate. And then I'm gonna print also here after I'm gonna print J. Okay, just double check if that looks good. So we're, we're setting I to 10, J to 10, 20. We're printing I, we're printing J, we're calling foo, we're printing I, we're printing J. Now back up in foo, here is the difference. We're going to not pass in an int, we're gonna pass in what's called a reference to an int. So it looks like an int, it looks like you passed it by value, but actually it's taken a it actually means the original one back up at main. So when you run this thing, we have to also add the debug statements here. So let's add this, whoops. Yeah, we want to, let's add uh, here, we can add uh, two to y just to make it a little different. All right, so this is the next challenge. Try to figure out what that would do. Um, I kind of gave you a hint and see if you're right. And let's compile this down here and see if it runs. And here's what we get. Now, we already did the i case. So the i is 10, and then it goes to 10, and then it goes to 11, and then the i stays 10. In this case, with the reference, the j is 20. It starts at 20 in foo. It adds two to it, and then it comes back out and look, this is the whole key of why the reference is different. So a reference passing it can sometimes be what you want. If you want, the function to not just work on a copy of the thing, but to work on the original, you use the reference. And so 
This 22 here is directly a result of the fact that this is a reference argument here, y. And so that's the two classes of arguments in general giving to a function like this are gonna be passed by value or passed by reference. And I wanna just finish the picture. Oh wait, yeah, let's, let's write this picture here to show you what that is in the memory scheme. So same idea, here's the memory space all the way from zero up to the eight billion. Same here, right? In this case, now you've got foo up here. And just like before main, there's a, there's a space down here, somewhere there's a J that the compiler allocated for main. Now when it calls foo, what it thinks of as Y it does not allocate something here, it just points down to this memory. So there's still only one memory location. So everything that happens here, like the plus equals two that we called, doesn't happen, there's nothing here that it stores. It only references the exact same memory location that, it, that main was using. All right, the third one to complete the picture is to do this by pointer, which is a little more of an old fashioned way to do it. Um, here we go, let's make a K. And let's make it 30. And here's a, let's just keep copying this stuff. Whoops, don't need to copy that one. There's a K and then here's printing the J. So let's just review what we did here. We're just like the other two, we're making a new variable called K. It's just an integer, just like the other two. We're printing it. There's the original J, original K. We call it, then we call, then we print the original, then we print the, the after I, the after J and the after K. Okay, let's go up and change the foo now. Now this time we're gonna do, you can imagine it's the other combination of these things. It's gonna be the pointer, right? And let's call this one Z, just to keep the names separate. Okay, we're gonna print Z. We're gonna add three to it, just to be different. And we're gonna print it down here again, right? So does that look okay? All right, this will fail to compile. The challenge is, uh, do you see why? Why would this fail to compile based on what you know already? And you know it's gonna be something to do with this thing that we added. The hint is that it's something to do with this. Now, so welcome back. I hope you tried that and you got some compile errors. The answer is that when you declare a pointer argument like this, it expects, well, here, let's see what the answer is. Let's see what the error message is so that you can understand that. So let's compile it and here it is. Uh, it's line 23. So let's go look at that. It's when we call foo, invalid conversion from int to pointer of int. You see, it, we gave it a K here in the third argument, um, but it expects, we've told it that it should have a pointer there. So we don't just give it K. Can you think of what we have to give it? In this case, since it wants a pointer, we have to give it the address of K. Remember the ampersand sign is the address of, and the star sign is the dereference or the contents of. So those, those are complementary. You can actually take the address of something and then take the, take the contents of it, and it, you'll be, always be back to where you started from. So this time we're gonna give it the pointer and then we're gonna come in here. And then there's gonna be one more problem with this compile um, that you'll see. I'll be curious if this is a compile error or a runtime error. Um, it's because Z is a pointer. So the suspicion is that this line here uh, really is wrong. It's adding three to the pointer of Z. This may crash. <laughs> um, it didn't crash. Um, but it's not what we really want either. And this is a good idea, a good little glimpse into why pointers get tricky. You really wanna stick with pass by value or pass by reference when you can. When you start working with pointers, you can be manipulating things. Like here we're adding three, right? We intended to add three to the actual int, the thing the Z pointer was pointing to. But what we did was we added three to the actual pointer value. And in fact, there's even a more tricky part here. When you add to a pointer like this, when you add three to a pointer, it doesn't just add three, it adds three of the ints, and the ints four bytes each, so it added 12 bytes. So this is sort of an advanced challenge, but if you if you look at the math here between these two hexadecimal values, and hexadecimal is just a fancy name for saying base 16, you can see that we actually added, um, we, we took the Z and we added 12 to it, because so, it went from a zero to a C in hex, which is 12 decimal. So that's all a way of saying that this code did not do what we were trying to demonstrate. What we really want here is to say the contents of Z. And that's the problem when you pass a pointer into a function. Um, 
you, you always have to remember to use that pointer dereference every time you want to use it. Otherwise, you're going to be manipulating the pointer itself instead of the underlying data. So that's why most of the concerns about using pointers in C++ are valid. It's, there, it's kind of scary to use pointers. That's why also that you should always really be using references when you can. They just lead to much cleaner code and less chance for error. And it's the same, essentially it's the same effect. So let's go ahead and show that. So we're gonna compile that and run that. And now look at what we get here. Oh, we didn't print, actually, well, I'll fix one more thing up. When we print this, we, we can print the value of Z instead of the pointer. See, again, we had a problem with the pointer. So let's go ahead and compile that again and then run it. Now we get K should behave just like J, it should behave just like the reference. So it starts at 30. We call into foo and it's and it stays 30, that's fine. It makes a, it's still pointing to it. Um, we add three to it and then we come back out and look, main thinks that its value of K has gone up by three. So let's do the picture on that one just to complete this, this analysis. So here we go, here's the zero to, here's the memory space again, all the way from zero to eight billion. And then here is the memory location right down here where it's put K. The compiler says K is gonna live right in this exact byte of this eight billion bytes. And then main knows that. So main when it references K aims right at that spot. Foo, the Z doesn't point anywhere up here. It points just like the reference case. It points right down here to that same one. So when we add three to it, uh, it's actually adding three down here. So that's why you see the result when you come back to main um, and run. Um, okay, so that really is the summary of the three ways that you pass arguments in. Now, other languages have this exact same issue when they deal with it different ways. And it's kind of curious to know, like in Python, this is actually a source of a lot of confusion too. You, you don't have you don't have the pointer variation in Python, but you do have these two variations. Sometimes in Python, it'll pass by value and sometimes it'll pass by reference. And that depends on what type of object it is. So. Uh, this is not just a complexity with C++. You'll see this in every other language too. And it also has to do with what function you're trying to provide. And that has to do, and that's gonna set up the next challenge. So here we go. Here's the next challenge for you. And it's a little bit of a big one, but I think you're ready for it. We want to code, remember that version of the uppercase. I'm gonna give you the what's called the function signature. And then I want you to fill in the details. So here we go, string s. Remember before we wrote a routine called to upper that took in a string and then it returned a new string that was the uppercase version of that string. This time I want you to implement to upper using a reference now. So it's going to modify the string in place that you call it with. It's not gonna return a string, it's returning void. So let me show you how we're gonna use this. So here's the guts, I want you to fill in this part for the challenge and here's how we're gonna use it. We're gonna say see out um, we're gonna say, first let's print dog lowercase, and then we're gonna say C out to, oh wait, no, actually we need, to, we need to do it the other way. We need, we need to say string s, uh, and this is another way to do the initializer, dog, instead of the equals, either way is fine. Um, let's print s, and then let's call to upper s, because it doesn't return anything. I can't print the two upper, but then I can print S again. So I'll just copy that line again. Okay, now look at that and see if you understand what I'm asking. S is a string. We're initializing it to something lowercase dog. Uh, that If you haven't seen that before, that's that's the same as this. That's another way of doing that. It's just a different style. Sometimes this is seen as a little bit cleaner. Um, we're gonna print it. We're gonna call two upper on it, and then we're gonna print it again and see that it went uppercase. So I'll give you a hint in a minute, but if you wanna try that, Stop now and try to code the two upper function. Okay, here's a couple hints. One hint is that we're gonna need string, because <laughs> since we're using strings now. And another hint is that the routine that we know you worked, and this is back in a previous module. Um, it's back in the module, I think, gosh, I've forgotten now. I think it's module seven. Um, the, Routine that we're gonna use is called to upper, and it takes a character, right? So it takes one character out of the string. That's the kind of low level routine that you can use in this thing. So somehow use that, that's, that's your hint. Okay, hopefully you're back now and you've tried that, and let me go ahead and code that, and let's see if it's the same as what you have. For this, it's easy just to use the simple uh, range-based for loop where we just say, 
care. Ah, this is going to be good. So care C, let's do it this way first. Okay. This is not going to work. And this is a good challenge to, uh, to ask you why. Um, look at what we're doing. Okay, we have a string down here in main that's dog. We're going to print it. We're going to call to upper with that dog. Now that's called in by reference. So the S here doesn't have to be the same name. Maybe I can make this a different name just to keep that clear. Um, maybe, maybe I'll call this um, name down here, okay, just to kind of make it clear that we don't need to have the same S. Um, so here's, here's this thing called name that we've called dog. Now up here, this reference here is good. This is a good step. We're binding this S now to this original name down here. So anything that we do to S down here, any part of the modifications of S, are going to show up into this thing. So when we print this down here, we'll see the modifications. Okay, so we look over all the characters. It's going to copy one character of S into this C, and then it's going to make it upper. Oh, we need, an, we need a uh, semicolon there. And then it's going to go. Now, let's run this, and let me show you that it doesn't shouldn't work. Aha, it didn't. Okay, so that's the challenge. Can you figure out why that didn't work? And here's the reason why, is that... This care here is making a copy. This is, remember those three ways. There's by value, by reference, and by pointer. That's a by value copy. It's copying every character out of string, and it's copying it out as C. You're, you, this function is happening. The two upper is happening, but it's only happening on this copy of each letter. It's not happening on the original string. So there's two ways to fix this. The first way to fix it is instead... Um, well, let me see. Actually, let me do the reference way first since we have this code here already. So the first way to fix it, which is a nice elegant way, is you make this a reference. Okay, do you see how the same idea that we used for the function arguments applies in this loop? We can say, oh, don't just make a copy of each letter to C. Make a reference. This C is going to stand for the actual underlying string here. And that underlying string here, because this is a reference, also stands for this underlying name here. Okay, so we've changed the C that's in the loop to be now a reference to point to every character in S, and then we call to upper on C. Uh, let's run this. There's still one more glitch to this, but I'll show you. Let's run this, and you get it doesn't work yet. And why? And that's because the to upper call doesn't actually work in place. It only returns the value. So you have to say C equals to upper. Now, the two upper call might have worked the other way or it would have worked in place, but it doesn't. It returns the uppercase value and it leaves C alone. So um, this should give us the final answer. And if you run this, you get capital dog. Okay, so that was one way to do it where we added the, the reference here. Um, another way to do it is to loop over and this, let's use the counting form of the for loop this time. I less than, than the, the length of the string, I plus plus. And now we're going to say the string i character equals to upper of itself. So we're going to overwrite each character of the string with a to upper version of itself. And this only works if this is a reference here. Um, in fact, I'll try it without just to show you, but this should also give us the same answer. So let's compile this and run this and you also get the capital capital D jog. Let's pretend that this string was not a reference here, right? So we're just doing, we're just copying in by value. Now, is this gonna work? Um, it shouldn't, right? Because you're just modifying down here. Every, all the uses of S down here are just modifying this S. It has nothing to do with this, this, this name up here. So if we compile that just to show that point, and run that, you'll see that it leaves the name up in the main as dog. So throughout the rest of this course, and really in any C++ code you're going to code, um, this is a fundamental difference, and it's, and it's not something that you'll miss. It's very obvious. Every function that you call always is very careful to say, am I taking this argument in um, as, a, as a value, or am I taking it in as a reference? And there's even a third variant of this, which we'll get to later, which is a const reference. So if it's a very big object and you don't want to pass it by value, you can pass it by a const reference. And that allows you to 
um, be more efficient about the way you pass it in, but it also still does not allow you to modify it. And so you'll see a lot of those. You'll see a lot of pass by value of small things, pass by reference of, of, of small or bigger things. And sometimes the bigger things will have const reference on them. And so we'll see a lot more of that in the, um, in the next few modules. The next topic we're going to discuss is the heap. Everything we've talked about so far has been about memory on what's called the stack. It's what the compiler allocates for each time there's a new function call. You start with main and every time you call like we were calling foo, it allocates a new chunk of memory where it puts in, it allocates space for all those local variables. But let me show you an example to give you an idea of what I mean about something not quite being right about that. There's something sort of missing and here we go. Let's make a, let's make a vector. Okay, and to do vector, we're gonna need to put a vector up here on the include. Let's do a vector of ints, and let's do the vector, let's call it x. Um, and vector takes a constructor where we can give it the size. So let's not just make it as a small vector, let's make it a thousand big. So there's a, it's already been resized to a thousand when we start. So I, I can just show you, I can put something in the vector, and I can print the vector out. Right, so this will just, just to show you an example of how we're using uh, that vector. So let's go ahead and compile that and run it and there we go. So we're printing out element 450 just by random. If you did not size it up to 1000 at the start, um, then um, that would fail, that would cause a, a problem. So my point now was to print out, let's get rid of these two lines. My point now was to print out, what's the size? Size of x equals, and let's do size of x. Remember how we were doing the other size of? You know, the character was one byte, the int was four bytes. Well, you might think this is gonna be 1,000 ints and each int is four bytes, right? So this might give you an answer of 4,000 or maybe there's even, maybe the vector class has some extra stuff. Like maybe it has some, a couple extra fields. And maybe we're gonna guess this is gonna give you, it's gonna print size of X as maybe 4,020 or something with a few extra fields. Let's print this out and let's find out. And there we go, it's 24. Now wait, how can that be? Somewhere they've stored room for a thousand variables. We know we can read and write a thousand different variables and they all get stored and they all can get read out. So those have to be in the DRAM somewhere. So where did they get allocated? And the answer is, it's this thing called the heap. And let me draw a picture of that. It's like a secret location. Here's the address space in the machine. So here's this, again, it's the same idea. It's always the same byte addressable space from zero to eight billion or 128 billion, however many gigabytes of RAM you have. And it's this huge address space, right? Now it turns out kind of for historical purposes, actually when you start the main, what they call the stack frame is actually way up high here. And every time you call something like foo, it actually drops to another stack frame. It's a little bit lower. And all the local variables, like if you have an I or a J or an X or even a vector or something, it, they'll be stored in there, right? So let's indicate that with some, some allocation in here. Here's the variables from main, here's the verb. So here's our variable, let's call it X, and it's sitting right here. And we know that the size of this X is 24 bytes. Well, where did the thousand go? And the answer is it allocates it from the heap. And the heap, if we can draw it in green here, um, actually starts at the bottom. There's some other stuff too, but it starts somewhere here at the bottom and it grows up. The stack kind of grows down and the heap grows up to meet it. And there's a whole gigabytes of empty space um, in the middle, right? So the heap then is this extra piece of memory that you can allocate that's down here. It's like another whole scratch pad. And down in there, you're gonna see is where the, the thousand bytes are. And it's hard to debug that without diving into the vector class, which I don't want to do here. That's too complicated. But we're, instead, we're going to get at that scratch pad ourselves. So it's not, it's not a secret thing. You can use it too. And that's where we do memory allocation. And this, again, is also one of those controversial topics. It's a topic that sends some people um, into panic. And this is the reason that some people don't like to use C++. But if you're careful about how you use it, it can be actually quite safe and it's very powerful to be able to use this extra resource of the heap. And let me just show you with our own code how that works. Um, let's make again an int. And this time let's give it a point. It's a pointer to an int. So we don't actually have the int allocated. And we're gonna say that pointer is going to equal, we can't say 
we don't want to say it's equal to eight or some value like that. We want to we want to say it's new. And we're going to say new int. And we can actually we can give the initialization value in there if we want. So now let's print that thing out. Um, and we can print out star p like we did before. Or we can make another variable like x and have it assigned like this and print out x, right? So let's try that. And I'll see if I can um, explain what's going on. So that compiles and it runs. And there we go. So we get 8 and 8. Um, let's draw a picture of that again over here. Let's use the same color scheme. Let's use this blue for the entire memory space. Here's our stack up here. So what do we have? We have a variable up here. This is the actual pointer called p. It's a pointer to an int. And then we have on the stack, we also have this thing called x, which is here. And then on the heap, we've got this chunk of memory down here that's, that's also four bytes. Now, when you say p gets this part here, this new int, this is coming off the heap. So it's asking the compiler uh, the size of an int, which is four bytes, um, out of the heap. So it allocates this and it sets the value in here so that this points to that value. So the contents of P is a pointer that points down to this thing on the heap. Um, then we print it, which prints the contents of the heap, and then we um, assign that same value to x. So that assignment takes, it dereferences p, finds this piece of memory, and copies it in to where x is, and then it prints out x, which is 8. Um, so that's the way the heap works. And the main motivation for us for using a heap is that we learned last time that the hash tables and the vectors can move things around on you. And what we want when we build up more complex structures is to be able to allocate on the heap using this new, we want to allocate a bunch of the words from our library. And we want to have them allocated only once. And then we want to have a bunch of vectors uh, and data structures that point to them. But we want to have those raw words themselves never move on us. So that's why we're going to use the heap. Um, and so we're essentially done with this lecture except for just one detail here is that when you allocate things off the heap, it's up to you to take them off the heap. And that is done with the sort of opposite operation, which is a delete. So every time you do a new on something, you do the delete of it. And if you don't do deletes, this is what um, ends up causing uh, memory leaks. And there are other tools to analyze those and fix those. So in general, they're not a huge problem, um, but they're always given as a big problem. You know, people always talk about what a what an enormous problem memory leaks are. I don't find them that big a deal, but uh, it depends on how you code and how careful you are about when you do a new and when you delete. And we should introduce this topic of a smart pointer. And then the last topic for this module is called uh, unique pointer. It's a type of managed, uh, managed pointer. So this here is called a naked pointer and it's frowned on by many people for good reason because it means that the user then has to make sure that for every new they call, they call this delete. And sometimes it can be tricky. There might be cases inside the guts of this code. This might be, you know, 100 lines long, where certain times you might return early or you might have some other case um, and not get down to this delete case. And you might miss it and then leak memory in that case. So there's a nice way to handle that. And it's part of this include file. You need, you need the include file called memory for it. Um, and it's called a unique pointer. And so instead of having this naked pointer, you're going to say unique pointer and we have to give it a type it's a template so it needs a type of pointer that's going to be int and we're going to call it p again and we need to use this form of the initialization for this pointer you can't use the equals because when you construct it you need to give it the thing that it's going to be populated with and that is going to be the same thing new int and we can still assign it eight if we want to that's fine so that's going to replace our naked pointer um and the point is the point is that when it goes out of scope, when P ceases to live, P always has a lifetime, which is going to be what? Between, between these braces. Every variable, every local variable has a lifetime. And when it goes out of scope, it will call the destructor automatically of unique pointer. And unique pointer is really nothing more than just a pointer with a destructor on it that deletes the pointer. That's it. So you don't need this anymore. This 
the requirement for this goes away. In fact, if you call this, you're going to get in trouble. It'll, it'll double delete. So you want to get rid of that delete. And so that's called a protected pointer or a scoped pointer. Uh, unique pointer is the current correct name for that in the latest version of C++. And let's just, um, let's go ahead and show how it, how it runs. Um, here, we'll compile it and then we'll um, run. Oh, um, oh, I have an extra line in here. So we'll clear that out and then we'll compile it and we'll run it. And you see that it gives the same results, eight and eight. So um, this is a fine strategy to use and it's really the recommended one. Although I find that if you have a very controlled environment where you allocate your news uh, very carefully with objects that also have a very good lifetime. So you can, if you have a new and a constructor for an object, you can put the delete in the destructor. You just, the concept is you want to pair those things together. And there's a fancy name uh, for this whole teak. It's called, uh, it's called R-A-I-I, -I, which is a dumb acronym, but it stands for resource acquisition is initialization. It just means that it's, it's also called scope bound management. It means that you want your objects to be fairly smart in the way they acquire resources. Like this is acquiring this resource of a, of a, of a piece of memory on the heap. And when it goes out of scope and it calls the destructor, you want it to release that resource. So that same design philosophy can be really useful for all kinds of resources, whether it's you know files or whether it's some other sort of data structure that's shared between things. Um, whenever you acquire something, you want the destructor to handle the release of it. Or, you know, and sometimes you have to coordinate ownership between things. So we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the next module about ownership of data. When you create resources, who owns the, the data and who, who allows it to be shared with other people and who ends up being responsible to delete it. Um, those become really important issues for when you design larger data structures. So we're now set for doing the actual work of the pattern hash, which is what we've been driving for for several modules now. So in the next module, we will bring up the library again and we're going to find all of the matches of partial words like D blank, blank, blank. We're gonna find all the words that in the library that will match that pattern. And we're gonna do it not just slowly by iterating over the whole library, we're gonna do it very fast by using hash tables. So that should be, um, that should be an exciting module. So hope to see you there.